So the other day, I got an email from a friend, a subscriber named Carla, and she had some questions for me, and I thought I'd share these questions with you and share the my answers, okay? Uh, keep in mind that these answers are based on my opinions, my experiences. None of it is intended to be advice, okay? I, I'm, I don't give advice. As soon as I come back, I'll get started. Hey! Oh, rock a cheek. Hello there. So Carla sent me this email. She asked me some questions, and I wanted to share them with you. It's been uh, a, a while since we've done this. It's kind of like a Q&A. I think it's a, it's a good idea to share these ideas with people uh, because I know that some of you... I know that there's more people that, if I can get this right, I'll spit it out. I, I know that th these are very common questions, and I know that a lot of these questions can be answered by watching my videos. But, you know, we have almost 200 videos now, and it's, it's kind of hard to, to go through, you know, each one and try to find one answer. So... I don't mind sharing uh, my emails with you, my subscribers, and future subscribers, and explain some of the things that people are wanting to know about. So let's get started. Uh, Carl Rose said, I think you said you have private health insurance. Some people recommend a combination of private and IESS. I have several chronic pre-existing conditions, so I'm trying to figure out What's best for me? Can you talk about insurance and the advantage, disadvantage of each? So first off, Carla, I want to say I'm going to put a link in the description to uh, my friend Carlos at Blue Box Insurance. I'm going to give you his email address, and I encourage you to write to him and ask him uh, specific questions and, and be upfront if you will, about your pre-existing conditions. Let's face it, folks, we all, in, in this age range that we're in, we all have pre-existing conditions. But depending on the doctor you get, you may find a doctor here that will kind of help you overlook those and help you get coverage from your insurance company. When I first came here, I signed up for IESS. It cost me $71 a month. I, fortunately, I never had to use it, but I have friends that have been here same amount of time as I've been here, and I know one particular person that I would go as far to say that she is alive today. After arriving here in Ecuador, she's alive today because she had IESS insurance. She went in for a checkup with a, a cardiologist. They discovered a problem. She needed a stent, and she got it that day. There was no waiting, and it was all... 100% covered by IESS. By the way, you'll hear people around here say ES, okay? When you hear ES, we're talking about the same thing, IESS. I don't have IESS anymore. I signed up for private insurance. I bought a policy that's a $15,000 policy. It cost me $59 a month. It covers my prescriptions and covers my drugs, my office visits doctor visits, home visits, anything I've turned in a receipt for. My foot surgery that I just had here week before or last uh, is 100% covered by my private insurance. So when you talk to Carlos, ask him and talk to him specifically about your pre-existing conditions and ask him what coverage he has to offer. Carlos is a super good guy. He's not not like a used car salesman trying to sell you something that you don't need. He will sell you exactly what you need, and but he'll answer all your questions for you. Tell him that I sent you, okay? I put all of his information in the description. The second question, there are tons of visa options. Boy, howdy. I qualify for at least three. I've been trying to figure out which one is best for my situation. I wish their retirement visa gave discounts starting at less than 65 Besides the discounts, do you know of any advantages of one versus the other visa? The only thing that I have to say about that, Carla, is when I came here, now, keep in mind, I'm over 65, okay? I'm, 
I know that a lot of you are going to find this really hard to believe because I'm actually 70 years old, quickly approaching 71 in a couple of months, as a matter of fact. And um, when I came to Ecuador, I came here with the intention of, of getting a investor's visa. My I used Gringo Visa, and my uh, rep at Gringo Visa uh, asked me, you know, why am I here on an investor's visa? The disadvantage to having an investor's visa is your investment that you basically use to essentially purchase your visa is tied up. It's tied up the whole time you have your visa. You cash out your investment or you sell your property, you have to get another type of visa. You have, you lose that vi that visa. Now, things may have changed since I came here. And again, I recommend that you talk to the professionals and talk to my friends over at Equisys and see what, what, what Marcos has to say about the differences. But here's the way, here's, here's the way I chose not to come in on an investor's visa. I picked the regular pensioner's visa instead because I was fortunate enough to qualify for the pensioner's visa based on my income, and I didn't have to tie up my assets. And I could still invest if I wanted to. So I came in on a pensioner's visa. I bought CDs. I get income off my CDs on a monthly basis, and... When my CDs mature, if I want to take the money out of the bank, I can do so. I don't have to worry about my visa being compromised at all. Okay? So, again, I'll put Equisys information in the description below. Get in touch with them. Send them an email and ask them, you know, what is best for you based on your circumstances. Not everybody has the income requirements. It's $1,275 per month. But they have money to invest. You can either buy property or you can buy CDs. You can, there's a number of things you can invest in. And, you know, you have to pick what's best for you. But don't think that just because you want to invest here, and especially if you have the income either from Social Security or a pension or some an annuity or anything, don't think that you have to have an investor's visa. You can get here... You can get in here fine on a pensioner's visa. The next question Carla asks, you mentioned you wanted to get a car in one of your videos. Have you found one and or have, and, let's see, have you found one and or how much is a monthly cost, not including the price of the vehicle itself? I'm trying to accept what I've heard that I don't need a car. I wish they'd just bring me, let me bring mine, but I don't trust that. Some of these YouTubers seem to exaggerate when they talk about Ecuador, making it seem like a magical place. I've accepted that's just not true. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. There is nothing magical about living in Ecuador. Okay, it's a beautiful place, it's a beautiful country, but you know what? It's not any different than any other country in the world, to tell you the truth. There are differences, there's cultural differences, there's subtle differences, okay? But, you know, the the the... It's, it's not it's not a paradise like you might might have been led to believe, okay? It's still a great place to come, but I wouldn't say it's magical. But back on the car, I do plan to buy a car. I, I, I can buy a brand new car here for less than $20,000. I'm not talking about a Mercedes. I'm not talking about, you know, I had a Nissan Rogue SL back home before I came here. That car cost me 34000 I think it was. In the states, I ended up selling it for twenty, and it was a nice car, all leather and cherry. But here, I mean, I can buy a Ping Dong Chinese car, uh, an SUV with leather interior, full navigation, uh, lane assist driving, backup navigation, camera all the way around, everything for nineteen nine ninety five. That's out the door, folks. Okay. Insurance cost me a couple of $300 a year, and I'm good to go. Gasoline here is less than $3 a gallon. Diesel is $1.71 the last time I checked. I intend to buy a car. I don't listen to all these idiots out there that say, oh, don't buy a car, it's dangerous. You know, well, it's not any more dangerous here than it is in the United States. Come on, folks, get real. Now, I do. I, there are differences, but 
They're, they're subtle. All right? There are lots of people that drive cars here. Lots of cars. Lots, and lots of new cars. You see lots of new cars out on the road every day. There are risks involved with having a car here, and I'm aware of that. I'm well aware of it. For an example, oh, like, well, what do you mean, Don? Well, uh, <laughs> they have traffic laws, but I don't think anybody enforces them. The, to find a stripe on the road is like winning the lottery. To, watch, to see orderly driving, organized driving, orderly driving, whatever you want to call it, you're not going to see that here, okay? The roads are not the best roads around, you know, but there are good highways here. Depends on where you go. So, yeah, I mean, there's some risk. And then people drive like nuts here. So, yes, there's risk. But, you know, I'm going to buy a cheap car and I'm going to take my chances. And I don't care what anybody says. All you naysayers that say it's dangerous to have a car here, bite me. The pictures I saw of Monta really sold me, the whole oceanfront living. But I'm curious what the rest of the city looks like. I did subscribe to the Raw and Real page, so I'll check it out. Are you still planning on leaving Monta? I'm starting to worry that I'm going to get bored there at some point, but I do want to start at the Olsen initially. This is a big, huge question. This question is part of the reason why I had to take down my video from yesterday and make a correction to it and repost it, my TMT number one. I mistakenly stated in the video that, yeah, the oceanfront part of Monta is beautiful. When you look at it from the, from the air, it's like looking down on Costa Rica or Panama City or Miami, San Diego. You see beautiful condo buildings up and down the coastline. But then when you get into the city, I mistakenly said yesterday that it looked like a war zone. So let me explain that, folks, just briefly. I don't want to go into a bi I don't want to get in a big fight over this. Mainstream America refers to the hurricane damage in Fort Myers, Florida, as looking like a war zone. It's okay for them to say that, but for me to say that it looks like a war zone here gets misunderstood. I I I, I can't say that. I have to officially retract that statement because. It doesn't fit in with the culture here to say that it looks like a war zone. It's, Monta is a very old city. It's an old fishing village that's grown. It's still growing. It's had growing pains. More importantly is Monta was hit hard by this earthquake in 2016, and there's still lots of damage. You get into some parts of Monta and you see structure that looks like it's about to fall down. And then you go a block and you see a nice modern home, you know? I, it's not fair for me to say it looks like a war zone because we can't compare it to Fort Myers, Florida after a hurricane. But I remember when I came here, that's the first thing I thought of was that a hurricane came through and they didn't clean up. But the truth of the matter is, is that th there's no money here. People can't fix things like they do in the States. And you have to look beyond those walls. You have to look, you know, on the other side of those walls are people, the Ecuadorian people, some of the most wonderful people you meet in the world. If you want to test that, I challenge you to come here and go to the mall and walk through the mall and say hello to people. Guess what? You're going to get, you're going to get a response. People are going to speak back to you. They're going to make eye contact with you, and they're going to say hola. Buenos dias, buenos tardes, buenos noches. You know, they speak to you. There's people, there's love here. People here love people. So you have to look beyond this infrastructure damage that you see and don't think of it, Don, as a war zone because it's, it's not a war zone. There's nothing further from the truth. I want to make it clear about that, that I, it's not, there's beautiful parts of Monta, especially Oceanfront, and then you go into the city and you kind of go back in time and you see the real heart of the city. You see the real heart of the people here. You know, you see some damage from the earthquake. I mean, yeah, from the earthquake. 
and you and you see houses and living spaces, dwellings with openings for windows where there's no windows, no glass, no covering, no nothing. But people are living there, and those people are just like you and me. They have a heart. They have. A, they love their family. They have strong family values. And they love, they love everybody, and they're friendly people. So that's the way you got to look at it, okay? If you want to come here thinking that you're going to be in a really luxurious setting, well, you can be here on the ocean front. You're going to pay for it. Most of Ecuador is not like that. Am I still planning on leaving Monta? I probably will at some point. I'm going to buy a car and stay here for a couple of years. I know for sure. If it wasn't for my girlfriend, I probably would have been already been gone. That and the fact that I still have dental work to be done and and I had my foot operated on here and I may get my other one operated on. So, yeah, I'm probably going to leave Monte at some point, but it's not because I don't like it here. It's going to be so I can continue my my exploration of this country and South America as a whole. You could get bored here in Monte. There's not a whole lot to do here. Beautiful beach down here. You can go kayaking, you can go fishing, you can go swimming, you can go hiking. Monte is close to a lot of stuff. There, there's, there's. You have to make things to do here. Volunteer, you know, get involved in some of the volunteer activities that go on around here. So that was those questions from Carla. And then guess what? She sent me a second email with more questions. And that's okay. She says every time she listens to my one of my videos, she ends up with more questions. And that's that's fine, Carla. So here goes these questions. There's five more questions. Can you put me in contact with the people you use for your CDs? Well, absolutely I can. I'll put a link in the description to my friend Javier Bermudez over at JEP. I like JEP. JEP is a cooperative, which here is that's like a co like a credit union. In the States, I, put, I bought my CDs there. I have my savings account there. My interest for my CDs gets deposited into my savings account every month on the same day, which is on the first of each month. And then I have a debit card to use for spending that money. I pay my electric bill. I pay my internet bill. I pay one other bill. Oh, my insurance all gets paid out of my JEP account. I do it all online. The rate of return is amazing. Our, there are people advertising as much as 10% on some of these cooperatives. I don't know how true that is. I don't know how safe it is. And as you know, I don't like to give advice, but uh, there is, every once in a while, I'll, I'll make an exception to that rule. I do advise that if you come here with a large chunk of money, don't put it all in one basket. Spread it out. Spread it out amongst the cooperatives so that you can have better protection from COSIDI. COSIDI is the Ecuadorian equivalent to the FDIC insurance program. So, second question. I have a swab account that I use strictly for travel. Actually, I have the checking account here as well as the one for investing. Is it the checking account one that you recommend having your money deposited into? So at Swab, I have my IRA. I have an investment account that I use for when I want to buy stocks and stuff like that, which I don't do very often. I'm actually basically using that as a holding pot for tax money. And then I have my investor checking account. My uh, income, monthly income, gets deposited via direct deposit into that account. And when I need a large amount of money to come here, I'll do a domestic bar transfer from Swab to Bank of Potenza in Miami, and then Bank of Potenza sends it to my bank, my savings account at JET here in Monta. Takes about two days, costs me 25 bucks. For everything else, for my daily spending money, you know, I, I use the ATM in the mall. I like using the Bank of Waikil ATM because it's all in English. It's in Spanish and English, but you can choose when you first log into it. You can choose whether you want Spanish or English. They, they charge $1.50 fee, and then, of course, Swab reimburses me for that fee. Next question, do you have a local bank account, and or do you recommend getting one? Yes, I do. I just talked about it, I, my JEP account. 
J-E-P, that's January Echo of Papa. Uh, they're all over Ecuador. They are, they pay interest on your savings accounts. Not anything to brag about. I have a debit card to that account. I do recommend you have a local account. Uh, you will, you will find a time when you'll need it. You know, you can actually have your, your investments. You can have Social Security directed, direct deposited into your JEP account. Now, I don't know. Let me think about that for a minute. I might not be accurate about that. That's, that's another reason to call uh, Avier, Avier and ask him, talk to him about that. But yes, I do. I do recommend having a local bank account. Uh, there will be times where you, you will need it. Uh, the fourth question, I'm coming to terms with the reality that many things near and dear to me won't make the trip. I'll miss my books. Do you know anyone who has shipped household goods there, and is it a waste of money? I heard you say in the video you wish you had brought more clothes. How many suitcases did you have? Now, I'm going to do a video with a friend here in the next few days that had a container brought in. And matter of fact, I saw the container being unloaded down the street. I can't wait to interview this couple and get their feedback on how the container experience was for them. I have another couple, friends of mine in Cuenca, that had a container brought in. They had a piece of marble top that was used to, for their entertainment center that got cracked in half. I'm telling you folks, and from my own personal opinion, it's better and easier to liquidate as much as you can, put everything else in storage for at least a year in the States, and come with the bare minimum. There's multiple reasons for doing it that way. You may not like it here. You may come here and make it through the honeymoon period and then decide quickly that you want a divorce. I've seen it happen. I don't recommend just right off the bat coming here with a container full of your goods and moving in because if you don't like it, you're going to have a problem. It's a major job shipping a container. Everything in that container has to be detailed on a manifest, and it has to be in Spanish. Everything. Toothbrush, knives and forks, everything. Everything you own that's in that container has to be documented and it has to be in Spanish. And you're going to pay a lot of money for it. Seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars. I came here with two large suitcases and one smaller suitcase and two backpacks. My, I, a couple came with me and we split the load up amongst them and that's how I got away with how, having to pay anything extra for suitcases. I came with the bare minimum. I wish I brought more clothes. I can't, I'm a large guy. I'm, I'm 6'1", 230 pounds. I, I wear a size 13 shoes and I can't find a pair of shoes here at all. I had to have them brought in from Amazon. I'd get somebody to mule them in for me. Same thing with socks and t-shirts. I wear these these Amazon t-shirts that are 2XL. I can't find a 2XL shirt here. I'm sure there's some here somewhere, but so far I haven't been able to find them. What's a good amount of time for a reconnaissance trip? I think I want to start my retirement life on the coast, but I may hate it. Cuenca sounds great, but I'm afraid of the altitude. In the first place, don't be afraid of the altitude. Some people can handle it just fine. A lot of people handle it just fine. I probably could get used to the altitude if I just gave it more time, but I was only there for a month. I, my girlfriend's in Monta, so I came back to Monta. If I didn't have her, I'd probably be in Cuenca right now until I just absolutely couldn't handle it. Some people can handle it. Some people never had trouble with the altitude. A reconnaissance trip, you know, exploratory trip. People will ask me if I took an exploratory trip, and I say, I'm doing it right now. I came here with my stuff, and I'm still doing my exploratory trip. Some people come here for six weeks or a month, you know. I, I You know, to me, to really get a feel for this place, I, I say six months. That's just my opinion. That, you know, six months. It, it was costly for me to do that. I couldn't do that. It was easier and cheaper for me just to come on with my stuff, and if I don't like it, I can always go back. That's the way I did it. I think that's it. Anyway, that's it for now. Let me listen to more videos. Yeah, please do. I'll try not to keep sending questions. You can send all the questions you want, Carla. I don't mind. There's, if, it's, if, if there are questions that I think that other people will need to know about, I'll do them in a video.
So anyway, that's it. I'm going to put all this stuff in. The, I'm actually going to put these questions in the description, and I'm going to put um, links to the answers to these questions in the description, and I'm going to put links to Blue Box, Equisist, and who else I mentioned. That's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you like this channel, please subscribe. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up. If you don't like it, adios. I'll see you on the next one. Ciao, ciao.